thanks for coming. Um, I'm Audrey Mooring, for those who don't know me, which is, I think, only one person. So, <laughs> um, And my project is connecting the Continental Divide Trail to local communities, engagement, and outreach in the San Luis Valley. Um, so today I'm just going to go over an introduction and tell you more about my partner organization, which is the Continental Divide Trail Coalition. And I'll probably say CDTC a lot, um, just so you know what that acronym is. And then I'll tell you more about the San Luis Valley, which is where my project was based. And I might say SLV, um, another acronym throwing in there. And then I'll go over my methodology, the results, um, opportunities for CDTC, and then finally the conclusion. And before we get started, I just want to do a land acknowledgement for both um, where we are today and the San Luis Valley. So I'll just read this. Today, we're standing on the homelands of the Arapaho, Cheyenne, Ute, Nations, and Peoples. Um, this was also a site of trade, gathering, and healing for numerous other Native tribes. And the San Luis Valley is sacred to many Indigenous nations, including the Utes, the Hikara Apaches, the Comanches, the Kiowas, Arapaho, Cheyenne, Navajo Nation, Pueblos, and all other First Peoples who once made the valley their home. And as we gather here today and talk about the San Luis Valley, I just want us to acknowledge, remember, and respect the peoples and nations of the stu original stewards of these lands. And also recognize that we're only standing here today um, at the dire cost to these native nations and peoples whose land was violently stolen. Um, I also want to give a little bit of context on the San Luis Valley, just in terms of um, indigenous peoples. So it's what was known as a bloodless valley, meaning um, it was just agreed upon that it was a space that there would be no war. Um, and many people, even if they were feuding or warring tribes, if they met in the San Luis Valley, it was just agreed upon that it was only a place of ceremony, trade, gathering, and things like that. So it really is a peaceful place, and I just want us to have that context going forward. So the Continental Divide Trail Coalition is a nonprofit organization, um, and basically what they do is they um, protect, promote, and are working to complete the Continental Divide Trail, which is um, 3,100 miles, and it goes across these five states from Mexico to Canada. And I just want to read this quote from their website because for me, when I first think about a trails organization, I was kind of just thinking, oh, they're just focused on the trail, but it's really a lot more than that. And so I think this kind of encompasses the work that CDTC does. More than a line on a map or a thin stripe of tread, the Continental Divide National Scenic Trail is a living connector of communities along the spine of North America, a thriving landscape of unique and precious ecosystems and a meeting ground where people of all walks of life may unite to live, work, play, worship, and learn. Um, and just to kind of point out where I'll be focusing on is kind of like this little nose. So that's um, the area that I was working in. So just to give you some background on my project, um, I was connected with them a little over a year ago and started talking to Teresa, who's the executive director, and Elle, who's the trail policy manager. And we just had conversations about what my project could be. Um, and they were really awesome about being like, well, what do you want to get out of this? Like, what are your career next steps? Um, and it was really important for me to like give them work that was meaningful and going to be helpful to the organization. And so through kind of these continuous um, conversations, we both kind of matched on, I really wanted to get more experience in like the diversity, inclusion, equity, justice space. And they do a lot in that space. They're really involved in several coalitions, including America, the Beautiful for All Coalition, which is um, just increasing like access for marginalized communities and underrepresented communities in the outdoors, similar to the 14 and 14 or initiative, which is the Colorado initiative to do the same type of thing. And so through those conversations, we just, you know, kind of landed on that I would be kind of focusing on that increased access and like reducing barriers and what that looks like. Um, and they talked to me about how they're really interested in the San Luis Valley, but they don't have a lot of context or information there. They haven't done a lot of work with that community, but it is something that they know is really important and kind of an underserved community. And so um, they were like, just go find out about that and like tell us like how we can, what information we need to like meaningfully engage in that space and like 
do work that is really community centered. And so that's kind of how my project was born. Um, and it's really a twofold project. So my first section I'll be going over next is just the context of the San Luis Valley, like what's going on down there from a socio and ecological perspective. And then the second part is my interviews, which I'll talk about later. So um, my project then is really focused on, you know, getting to know the San Luis Valley um, and how can the CDTC be successful working in this space? And so I used this systems approach, the socio-ecological systems approach, which is really key because, you know, for organizations like the CDTC, they recognize that these are interconnected issues. You have to have an interdisciplinary approach to solutions. And so you really have to understand you know, the people context is just as important, if not more important than the ecological context. Um, and so they really wanted to understand that. And um, let's see, I think that's it. So I'm gonna go over just these kind of bullet points. Um, and then here's just a map of where the San Luis Valley is um, in Colorado. And when I was there, I was there for like about five weeks and I stayed in Alamosa. So that's pointed out here. Um, and here's kind of a zoom in map of it. So it's made up of these six counties. Um, it's the largest Alpine Valley in North America, which is a fun fact. And then, so on this side are the San de Cristo Mountains. Um, and here's the Great Sand Dunes. So that might be, you know, familiar to some people. And then on this side are the San Juan Mountains. And this is where the um, Continental Divide Trail runs. So across this side. Um, again, I stayed in Alamosa when I was there, and then I also want to point out South Fork because that's what's known as a gateway community. So the Continental Divide Trail Coalition has like formal relationships with several different communities along the trail, um, and they work with that community to kind of you know increase you know tourism about the trail, but also try to help the community. So it's kind of like a relationship to help each other. Um, and that will be important kind of later in my recommendations section. So some demographics, um, it's of course hard to break it down this simply, but just to kind of show you how diverse the San Luis Valley is, um, it's 46% Hispanic. And then I also wanna make a note, like within that Hispanic population, there's a lot of different variety. Um, a lot of people that I talk to identify as Chicano or Mestiza or Mestizo, which is a being Spanish and indigenous descent. So um, I think that's an important note too. A lot of people that I talked to and worked with, they do have an indigenous ancestry. Um, and that, you know, I think is interesting to think about, especially in our program and maybe my own bias, just thinking about working with indigenous people. I always think of like associating with a tribe. Um, but a lot of these people aren't necessarily like associated with the tribe anymore, and that's for several reasons, but they still are, um, have this strong indigenous ancestry. Here's uh, a breakdown of the economy, just the kind of the major sectors in the San Luis Valley. So um, it is largely driven by agriculture, a third of the economy. Um, common crops are like potatoes, barley, wheat. Um, I was able to visit, interview, and tour a ranch when I was down there, which was really cool, um, a ranch that feeds cores, which is kind of interesting. And then 25% um, is unearned income, so people that might be on public assistance or retirement. 10% is tourism, but that is really interesting. Um, that Mineral County is 70%, and we, if we just go back to this graph and look at Mineral County, that's really important context for um, the Continental Divide Trail Coalition because they're saying like, oh, wow, this county is really driven by tourism. Um, and so maybe looking at Creed for more of a, you know, gateway community type of relationship could be something. Um, oh, no, one too far. And then, yeah, 15% are government jobs. And then we look at land ownership. This is um, also really important context especially for the CDTC. So again, Mineral County, that county I was just speaking about is 94% federal. So we can kind of make that connection of, you know, 70% yeah. tourism, people are likely there visiting public lands. Um, and then Costilla County is almost 100% private. And there are some really important legacy effects at play there. So there's these things called land grants, which were given um, when this area was not part of the United States, but it was part of Mexico. 
is given by the Mexican government and land grants are given um, to communities. So it's not like given to one person. So it kind of, you know, challenges our way of thinking of land ownership. It's actually communal, communal ownership. And what happened was the government, Mexican government gave these out um, to communities. And then when the area became part of the United States, some of the land grants were upheld by the federal government and some were not. Mm -hmm. And that, depending on if they were or weren't, really changes the land context and the land use patterns in the area even today. So Costilla County was, a lot of it was part of a land grant, the Sangre de Cristo land grant. Um, and when that was passed over, it was upheld, but because it was upheld, um, it was privatized and passed through the hands of many wealthy people, including an early politician, William Gilpin, just like it sectioned off and kind of um, now it's, you know, not public access where there's another example of the Conejos land grant that wasn't upheld and virtually all transferred into federal hands and now it's all public land. So that's kind of interesting how that plays out. Um, I do want to say on the Sangre de Cristo land grant, though, those people are still really actively fighting for their rights to the land, um, the ancestors of that land grant. And they've had a lot of success in it re really recently, actually, and um, do have some access rights to the land, which is really cool to see. So there's a lot of different kind of threats to the San Luis Valley, and I kind of loosely grouped them into these three categories. Um, of course, they're all going to be interrelated, but for climate, we know that climate change um, always exacerbates any or existing um, climate threat. Drought is a really big problem in the San Luis Valley. They only get about seven to 10 inches of rain per year already. So any bump in that number is going to be super significant. Um, and then, of course, we have seen in Colorado, wildfires are increasing. And of course, we know with wildfires, there's more chance for flooding. And so that's, um, of course, all a threat. And then if we look at the economy, um, there's something called payment in lieu of taxes. And for those who aren't familiar, that's when the federal government gives money to these counties for untaxable federal land. And considering that 55% of the land on there is federal, that's actually a decent amount of money. Mm -hmm. And that can be really affected when Congress um, doesn't pass legislation. So recently we've seen that and they can have problems getting money um, that they do depend on. And there are quite a few people that are dependent on public assistance. Um, and then for people, I think we like to think of outdoor recreation and tourism as like a positive a lot of the times. But what I found in my research and my interviews is a lot of people are you know, see this as a really big threat to their way of life. And, you know, they've been here for generations and they're worried about this term green gentrification. So I'm, I just learned about this really recently at a conference, but it's when you beautify an area or increase access to the outdoors, um, the area will usually be gentrified afterwards because there is this, you know, it is more beautiful and there are, is this increased access. So it's kind of like this cycle that, is defeating what we're trying to do, right? When we increase access in these areas. Um, and that is also leading to a loss of culture. A lot of people fear as well. Um, and then there's also a lot of other kind of threats um, to the population here. Mental health and drug use is significant and about 25% of the people in the San Luis Valley live under the poverty line. Um, I can't, of course, give an entire history on the San Luis Valley, but I'm just giving a few key dates here. So human history is traced over 10,000 years ago. Um, in 1598 was when the Spanish explorers first entered the area and the, um, their first meeting with the Ute people was peaceful. It didn't always continue that way, but it was initially. And then 1845 was the Sangre de Cristo land grant that I spoke about earlier. And then in 1848 was the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which um, is the treaty that ended the Mexican Mexican American War and gave the land, um, Colorado and a lot of the Southwestern United States to the United States. So uh, I also want to share this picture. So this was a picture that I took when I went to the Fort Garland Museum, which is in San Luis Valley. Um, and I think it's just important context to share just for our conversation and like seeing the trauma of the community um, that some of them still carry. So this is a slavery ledger. Um, and basically what we're looking at is there's names of the enslaved person and um, who bought them. 
And then like the age range, so it ranges yeah. from three to 38, I think on here. And then the date they were purchased, um, kind of an interesting thing that's not in the public consciousness that I think is really important to share is that um, some of this was happening after what is Emancipation Proclamation. It's happening after um, what we celebrate as Juneteenth. So what we celebrate as the end of slavery was not the end of slavery. Um, and it was still very much happening in this state. So these are largely you and Navajo people that are being enslaved. And it's very interesting to hear um, people that I talk to in the Valley about this who have this background in their family because they, some of them speak as if they were adopted into their family um, because a lot of times when they're children, it was because their parents were killed by people or they were taken away to internment camps. And then some people say enslaved. So that is kind of just, a, I think, an interesting rhetoric to explore. And then um, the last thing I kind of explored for the background was the organizations in the San Luis Valley. I think that's really important context for the CDTC to understand when they're working in the area. Um, so on the bottom row, I have like the federal partners and you know, CDTC already has a relationship with a lot of these, um, especially like Forest Service, for example, you know, a lot of the trail runs through Forest Service land, um, but just other key partners, the Sangre de Cristo National Heritage Area, um, that's funded by national parks, and they're really prominent in the area helping with helping with like sign interpretations and things like that, um, and just general education about the history, and so I think they could be a really key partner moving forward to tell an accurate history of the area that represents the people. So they work really hard to do that. Um, and then San Luis Valley Great Outdoors is a really awesome organization and has their, you know, fingers in a lot of different pots and really does take like an interdisciplinary approach in their work, which I think is super awesome. And um, of course, I have to mention San Luis Valley Ecosystem Council, who um, they do a lot of work too. And the ladies over there were really helpful in um, actually me forming my methodology and my project, and I'll speak a little bit more about that, but they're a public lands adv advocacy group, um, and they've been in the Valley for decades and um, will be really key partners for CBTC. So now um, the second part of my project was actually going to the San Luis Valley, and when I first was going down there, I was kind of under the impression that I might do a survey. Um, and when I sent a few cold emails and we're just trying to get to know people and kind of talk this out, I talked to the um, ladies at San Luis Valley Ecosystem Council, Chris and Anna, and they were both super helpful in being like, don't do that, <laughs> which was very okay. helpful because, and it was what I needed to hear. Um, they just kind of told me how the San Luis Valley is a place that has a history being taken from especially from a research perspective, like people just come in, they extract this information um, that could be useful if they gave it back, you know, for grant reasons and things like that, but they don't often. And so they're giving their time and energy into these research things and then they just never get anything out of it. And so they, with them, I kind of decided on doing interviews would be more meaningful and I'm very glad I did. Um, and they were really integral to that decision and, Part of what I wanted to get out of my um, experience too was taking a more participatory approach in my research. And that was really part of it, was working with community members who have this context and experience in the area. And they were like, yeah, you can interview us and then we'll help you like find more people to interview. So they were a huge help for me. Um, and interviews were really the I, meat of my research, but I also went to several community meetings and coalition meetings. Um, I went to a lot of different community events just to get to know different parts of the community. So I went to a drag brunch. I went to farmer's markets every week, Broncos watch parties. I did a bunch of different kind of stuff. So just to get to know people. Um, and then, of course, my literature reviews kind of helped frame all of my work that I was carrying out. So I have to um, shout out Jeff, who was my host when I was staying in the San Luis Valley. I was really lucky because I, like I said, I was just doing a bunch of like cold emails to like figure out where am I going to live and how much is it going to, you know, be. And so I reached out to Jeff because he's a CDT adopter, meaning he just like adopts part of the trail and takes care of it and maintains it. Um, but he also was working for a housing authority at the time. So I thought he could maybe hook me up with 
um, living situation. And he was like, oh, you can just stay with me. Like I have two extra bedrooms. I was like, okay, awesome. <laughs> and so I was able to stay with Jeff, which worked out for so many reasons. Um, he's a super well-connected community member. He's a third or fourth generation San Luis Valley um, resident. And he just, you know, always puts a smile on people's faces. So he really helped me meet a lot of people and is really passionate about the CVT. So this is us on his section of trail. Um, he has seven miles, but it's six miles both ways. So we had a 19 mile day, which was a lot. And I learned a lot about, um, you know, what it means to take care of a trail. He taught me a little bit about cross cutting, which I was not great at, but I got a good workout. <laughs> Um, okay, so for my interviews, I did a snowball sampling method, as I mentioned, just kind of meeting people as they went, which worked out really well. I ended up doing 13 interviews, and I could have definitely done more. Um, I was meeting people pretty, you know, pretty easily, which was really awesome. And I had a pretty diverse sample. You can see from my um, list in the middle, that's just kind of a random list I put together of the different kind of people that I interviewed. Um, and I really did a semi or unstructured approach. So I had a list of questions, um, but I didn't always use them. I just kind of wanted the person to really show me what was important to them and really express like what I needed to know about the San Luis Valley from their perspective. So if the conversation ever lulled or they wanted more structure, I would like ask my questions and stuff. But um, most of the time it was, you know, really natural and easy, which I really enjoyed. And, and it also helped kind of in building that trust and relationships, which I also saw as part of my work for CDT was, or for CDTC was kind of starting to build that relationship for them and get to know people. Um, and then I just put up some objectives that I think my project best connected to from our program. So I know this is a lot to look at, but I have basically the themes that I found on this side um, from my interviews. Um, so I used kind of an inductive coding method, just meaning I let the themes kind of emerge. I wasn't looking for anything specifically. And then um, next to them, I have, they're not all di directly related, but kind of just a recommendation of how the CDTC can meaningfully engage when they're gonna, going to start really working in the San Luis Valley. So just to talk about a few of these, I won't go over every single one, but for example, the connections to the San Luis Valley, you know, ties were often multi-generational. I spoke with several people that were six, seven generation San Luis Valley natives. Um, you know, they, a lot of these people, they have a saying in their family that the border crossed us. So, you know, they've been here for a really long time. Um, and they just really, you know, I found a theme with them was really, the fam familial history and how that really um, shapes their land use and how their connection to nature, which was really cool to hear about. Um, number two, community collaboration was really interesting to learn more about, especially after coming out of CLTL, because I think we read about it a lot of how like, you know, collaboration is the way to do things. Like you have to have coalitions, like that's the most effective. And the Valley is already doing that very well. They have a lot of different um, NGOs that work together and really do try to take a interdisciplinary and multi-scalar approach. Um, and I think it's also so they don't have to compete for funding, you know, things like that. Um, so they do that really well. And um, San Luis Valley Great Outdoors is a really good example of that. So here's just the recommendations so we don't have to look at um, too much text, but just to point out a few more, um, number four, respect and preserve heritage was a really important one. And these aren't in any priority order, they're just kind of random. But this picture is a picture I took at a community event that I went to. Um, the BLM is building up kind of this area for a river access area. And so they're having this community event because it's also a significant um, place historically for a lot of the communities. And it's kind of a contentious issue. And so they have this event where they provide dinner and they let everyone talk and they kind of let BLM and Sangre de Cristo Heritage Area and SLV go all kind of talk about, you know, their opinions and just trying to be really forthcoming about the project and give people a chance to actually um, submit history. So they're going to be interpretive signage to tell like a history of the area and why it's significant and hopefully build up that respect and appreciation for the area. 
Um, and it was really well done. You know, I was really impressed when I was there and several of my interviewees were there and they also told me that it was really well done. So um, I think that's like just a good example of how to properly, you know, do something like that. And also just a reminder, you have to give respect and um, include people, you know, the people with their history because they really do want to tell it. It's really a value to them. Um, and then a few more. Number nine is raising, just raising awareness about the CDT. Um, it really did become apparent in my interviews that a lot of people don't even know that the Continental Divide runs through their backyard, that it has a trail that they can go hike it. Um, and so I think there's really an opportunity for CDTC to get out and, you know, and just increase the knowledge of this is in your backyard and this is what it means for your water rights, which a lot of people really care about in the San Luis Valley being a headwaters area. Um, and so people are really passionate about their water. So I think making that connection is a really big opportunity. And then lastly, um, number 10, address future growth mindedly. This kind of goes back to what I was talking about, about green gentrification. Um, I think there's just this fear of, you know, increased outdoor recreation and what that means for the local community. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, just reminding CDTC, and I think they already, they're very aware of this, but just, you know, from my perspective and my research, um, you don't want to, you know, bring in more people, increase tourism, and then like move out the population that exists. So how can you do all of these things mindfully? How can you anticipate future growth in terms of population and tourism, and then balance that growth with the region's unique culture and environment? And also, you know, advocate for responsible development and policies that protect the San Luis Valley character and people. So that's just really important. Um, so this is just a something that I came across in my literature review, and I, I'll give a little context on it. Um, but it's basically from a paper that talks about how access to the outdoors is really an environmental justice issue. And this model kind of shows the different um, barriers, but I kind of used it to like plug in how our solutions, you know, can be multi-scalar. So um, the reason I'm sharing this too is just to really push an interdisciplinary approach. So knowing that when you come up with solutions and you're trying to increase access to the outdoors, for example, it's not just gonna be physical environment. For example, you know, this one says proximity to parks, it's not that simple. And I just want to share a story from one of my interviewees um, who was really familiar with the outdoor space. He spent a lot of time in the outdoors and he was gathering firewood with one of his family members and they got in kind of a fight and his family member left him and his phone was dead and it was kind of getting dark and, you know, he was comfortable in the outdoors. So he just started walking home and he had some firewood and he flagged down a truck because he just wanted to know what time it was. He wasn't going to ask for a ride or anything. Um, and this truck pulled over and they were just like yelling at him. They yelled a racial slur at him. Um, he was really scared. He felt, this was the first time he said that he felt um, afraid in the outdoors. And it made him uncomfortable to want to return to that area that he had been going with his family for a really long time to gather firewood. And so I think this you know, is a powerful story and speaks to like how important it is that we, you know, we can't just work at the physical environment, like the social environment is the example here. Um, if people don't feel safe in the outdoors, if it's not a place that's welcome to everyone and open to everyone, then it doesn't matter if they have access to it because they're not going to go there if they don't feel safe. Um, and so I think that's just something we need to really push when we're thinking about our solutions is having this like you know, multi-scalar approach. When we do environmental education, of course, it's important to teach about stewardship and taking care of the land, but it's also equally, if not more important to teach that the outdoors is a place for everyone. So here is a stakeholder analysis um, that I did for this, for CDTC. And for those who aren't familiar, basically what it looks at is the influence of a stakeholder from low to high, and then the interest. And interest doesn't necessarily mean how interested um, a stakeholder is. It means their capacity, perhaps. And, you know, so for example, I have San Luis Valley ecosystem up here. I know that they have really good um, influence in the area, so they're pretty high. Um, 
but there's only three or four people that work at that organization. So as you can imagine, they already have a lot of work to do and might not have the capacity to take on a lot of different projects. Um, and part of my participatory approach um, in my research was working with the stakeholders to place themselves on this map. So um, with SLV Go, when I asked them about it, they were like, oh, we're a 10 out of 10. So I put them pretty <laughs> high on both. And I agree. I think they do a really good job. They have a lot of influence. They're constantly working and connecting with the community and just like getting their name out there. And they do a really good job. And they do have a little bit more capacity. And that's their main work that they do. Um, and then, you know, I put Jeff up there. He, you know, doesn't go super high on influence because he's one person, but he is really well connected. Um, and he is really passionate about the CDT. So I did put him in the middle and he's recently retired. So we can even push him higher because now he has more time. To help. Um, okay. So what I did um, as part of my work too, was try to explore what opportunities there are for CDTC. So when they really do want to start engaging in the area, um, what can they do? So these are their four programmatic areas that they work on as, as an organization. So I just tried to split up the things I found into those programs so they can easily, more easily implement them into their existing programming. Um, so one thing that I came across in my time was working with SLV Go in a contractor called Cultivando. And what that's going to do is SLV Go is going to start having these community conversations with um, underrepresented communities, marginalized communities, um, and just kind of trying to get to know them more and build that relationship and build that trust and understand what's important to people when they're wanting to be in nature and things like that. So um, they've kind of informally opened the door to CDTC to be more involved in that. And I think, you know, if CDTC wants to start building up their name and engaging, I think that's a really good way to start doing that. And Cultivano is really awesome. They're really experts in this space. Um, they have some translators. So, of course, like Spanish is really important to translate, but there's a lot of other languages spoken in the Valley. Um, one example is Conjobal, which is a Mayan language. And so they have a translator for that. So it's just a lot um, that goes into these meetings. And I think that's a good way to kind of get involved. Um, one of my other recommendations is to kind of explore what the San Luis Valley would look like as a gateway region. So I mentioned a gateway community earlier, South Fork. And right now the CDTC only has gateway communities. They don't have a gateway region. Um, but when I was presenting the, to them, I just challenged them to think about this and explore it because I think it's a little bit more inclusive. Um, one of the problems with South Fork is it, it's a small population. So it's only 300 people that live there year round. And a lot of the other people, um, it's like their second or third home. And so the money going into the community might not be reaching the populations that it should. So if we expand it more, the tourism aspect more into Alamosa or San Luis or Del Norte or other cities, um, towns in the area, I think that could maybe just be more equitable and inclusive and also give the San Luis Valley a chance to maybe, hey, put some interpretive signage and tell like a history of the area and why it's really important. And um, I think that would maybe be a good opportunity. Um, I talked a lot with Volunteers for Outdoor Colorado, which is VOC, and they're gonna start helping out with um, doing a consistent project. So Jordan somewhat is someone that I worked with um, a lot from CDTC and he's really, geared up this consistent partner project, so like trail work. Um, and I think that will be really good once it's more consistent, just to kind of build the name of the Continental Divide Trail and, and you know have volunteer opportunities. And then lastly, um, on trail policy. So the people at San Luis Valley Ecosystem Council are working on um, a national conservation area and just trying to get people on board with that. And so I think, you know, the CDTC does work on trail policy a lot and this kind of stuff. So it's a good opportunity to add capacity to that effort. Um, and of course, the San Luis Valley, as many people probably know, is always fighting for their water rights. Um, and so I think just always having another person on your team for that and another resource would be super helpful for them. So my self-reflection, um, I learned a lot definitely during this time. I think 
building trust was, I learned a lot about what actually goes into that. I think in the classroom setting, it's like, oh yeah, you want to build trust. You want to ask the right questions. But I think being on the ground and doing it and learning about, you know, that these, a lot of these people have this trauma with public land, rightfully so, you know, it was taken from their families and their ancestors and having that context before you're talking to people. So you're not, you know, being ignorant to the situation. Mm -hmm. So I think that I learned a lot about what actually goes into that. Um, during my interviews, I think, uh, you know, a few of them started a little bit shaky because I'm just this like random lady. <laughs> that you don't know. <laughs> but I can confidently say by like the end of all my interviews that I had a really good rapport with everyone. And felt really comfortable talking to them. And then when I would see them later in the community, because it's such a small community, I would be like, oh my gosh, hi. And it was it was great to like feel that, like building that sense of community when I was there. Um, same with my interview skills. I really was able to build up my interview skills and kind of try to navigate that awkwardness. Um, and by the end, I, I, you know, I felt really refreshed every time I had an interview, like, oh, like this work does matter. It is important. And like people do want to talk about it, which was really motivating for me. Um, and I think, you know, I do think a natural strength of mine is adaptability. Um, but I think I was just reminded how important that can be in this kind of work, especially, you know, going down to the Sailor's Valley. I didn't know anyone. Um, and I've done things like that before, but I think every time it's, it's just hard at first. So just being able to be flexible and adaptable and try to make friends. Um, I was really just happy to practice that skill again. Um, something about community. So this whole project just really reminded me that now that I'm doing my career search and my job search, that's something really important to me if it's going to be really in the conservation field is that it has to be community centered and community led. And that's really going to be a priority for me when I'm, you know, looking for jobs is places that do put community first, because my personal beliefs are that people, you know, you have to do people-centered con conservation. And um, that's really gonna be, I think, it's just reaffirmed for me when I look through jobs. Um, and then lastly, I think it just really felt good to do an independent project. Um, I think the group work was of course great in CLTL, but um, I think I didn't realize that I did have some room for growth in individual work and just holding myself accountable. Of course, you know, I would have check-ins with Brett and have check-ins with Jordan and people at CDTC, but the small things I had to keep myself on a timeline and a deadline. And I definitely, um, I think I learned just, you know, learned a lot through that process of trying to hold myself accountable. Um, so yeah, I was just happy to have success in that space. And I just want to give some thank yous. Of course, everyone that I interviewed, um, everyone brought something so unique and special to the table. And I really appreciate them taking the time. I think I didn't mention, but my interviews usually lasted like, I think the shortest one was over an hour and my longest was like three and a half. You know, people were just really wanting to talk about this. So um, it was really awesome to have those conversations. Of course, Jeff, my host, I learned so much from him personally and professionally. Um, and we had such a fun time being roomies. <laughs> and Chris and Aunt Anna at um, San Luis Valley Ecosystem Council, like I mentioned, they were really helpful for finding interviewees and helping me just think through my research. Um, the team at CDTC, Teresa, Jordan, Liz, Elle, and Corey, they were all super helpful in their own way. My advisors and professors, and my family, partner, friends, and peers. Thank you for being here. And here's my sources. And there's my sister. <laughs> and that's it. Questions?